that may be listening. My name's David Young. I'm a member of the Boot Brisbane team up here in Cairns. And with me this evening is uh, Bill Bates, the head coordinator of the Boot Brisbane campaign. Uh, good evening, Bill. Good evening, David. And uh, our special guest for this evening, there's a bit of a late change, ladies and gentlemen. Dan McCarthy couldn't make it, but we have someone just as special as we would hope to have had in the weeks to come is the candidate for KAP for Mulgrave, uh, Attila mm-hmm. Fairholen. Uh, Attila, welcome and thank you for joining us on the show. Hello and thank you for having me. Now, listen, I must admit, I was, I was very, I was very happily, to, happy to discover that uh, Dan couldn't join us, as, as excited as I was to uh, have a conversation with Dan. But you're actually the KAP representative that's going to run for the seat that I live in, so it's really exciting for me to be able to talk to somebody that's not a rep- ex speaker from Brisbane or a, a, a representative from the central coast of Queensland, somebody that's actually poss- could. Uh, could possibly disrupt the egg cart and make better representation possible for us here in Mulgrave. So, mate, thank you for taking the time out of your week and evening to join us. My pleasure. Mm. Look forward to it. Um, mate, I have to kick off. First things first is, look, I, I, live, I live on the outer uh, skirts of Edmonton and we've just recently very tragically had a, uh, a car accident from the uh, corridor between Edmonton and um, Gordonvale, I believe, and, mm. and, 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 and they're arguably... Upgrading that stretch of road significantly too late than possibly should have because when we got the letter in the mail only recently to say that they're about to commence this major infrastructure upgrade that, uh, to, to my, to my, uh, surprise and, uh, great discovery is the biggest, the busiest stretch of the Bruce Highway in the whole of Queensland is actually between Edmonton and Gordon Vale. So what, what are your thoughts on the fact that we're a bit delayed in the upgrade of that uh, section of road as well as the roads in general in the seat of Mulgrave and North Queensland for that matter? as well as, um, you know, just the tragic state of the Bruce Highway in our area. I mean, it's just a sad state of affairs in, in, in many different ways, isn't it? It is a very sad state of affairs. We've, uh, I've grown up in Cairns most of my life, and I spent a fair bit of time transiting between Innisfail and Cairns while I was working on the farms down there. And to say that... It isn't that much different to what it was back in the late 80s, early 90s. Isn't stretching the tr- truth by that much. The the development has been drawn out. I think it was first discussed back in 1999. This plan was first discussed. Um, I think you'll actually find the records. 1958 was the first time there was anything mentioned about making it a dual lane carriageway in both directions from here to Brisbane. But... Um, it's never occurred. This development now has been dragged out over a 20-year period, 21 year. It'll be 23 by the time it's finished. Um, and I was actually caught up in the gridlock when this accident happened. And to see people put through this drama, let alone the tragedy of someone having their life lost, we don't know the circumstances around it, but... You can't deny that the road has a great <coughs> bearing on the amount of accidents we've had just in that short section. <coughs> the whole section is getting upgraded, and um, if I refer back to those who were here in 2017, you'll recall there was a bomb threat down near uh, the traffic lights at the service station on the highway just down the road from me, and that was... Nine hours of hell for a lot of people. Four hours to pick up their kids from school or daycares was the average time. We had five hours of road closure the other day. Um, Bob and I were discussing it recently about this proposed divergent, you could call it, a second freeway coming into Cairns. Uh, It was presented back in 1999 and it hasn't been reviewed since. And everyone keeps referring to it when you bring it up, saying um, the report said it's not relevant, it's not necessary at this time. But there's been no review on considering or even securing that parcel of land that runs between the cane farms and the inlet mangroves. No one has actually sat down and said, we need to secure that land and make sure it's there just in case, because inevitably... Mulgrave is the growth area now. Mulgrave is really the only place left where we can expand and accommodate the necessary 
uh, land for Cairns growth that we're seeing. Well, not to mention it's the major artery into the whole Cairns city and uh, northern area or beyond. Yeah. So uh, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a strange affair that they would prolong and prolong and prolong, and only finally in t- in, in 2020 yeah. would they decide to actually do something about it, even if it's not to the greatest extent that should be taken. But yeah. well, these developments are you could call them. That, and it's a term that's used a lot in business, and government seems to like this term. It's called just-in-time. And for those who aren't aware, a simple example is when you're building a car, all the parts are arriving just in time. So the wheels get to the production line and land there as the vehicle's rolling up to the production line and being put on. And that's a little bit what the government is trying to claim they're doing with these roadworks. But this duplication from Edmonton to Gordonvale isn't just-in-time. It was necessary minimum 7 to 11 years ago, at the very least. Well, this yes. is where we need to start this you know, forethought. Forethought and indeed, yeah. Historically, historically, great governments have done great things because they've planned ahead and not thought about their four-year term or the next term. They've thought about <coughs> the next generation. Hmm. Well, and they always use uh, Bradfield as an example when he was bri- building the Sydney Harbour Bridge as uh, everybody being confused as, mm-hmm. as to why it was so wide and, and why it needed to have four lanes or six lanes mm-hmm. when, it, when it was first being built. Forethought is everything. I mean, he wasn't a politician. It's probably part of the reason why why he mm-hmm. had the ability to have that forethought in lots of different ways. But they, he was given the support, no doubt, from the politicians. I want to mention, too, as a, as a yeah. better example of just-in-time uh, uh, distribution and uh, marketing is is the toilet toilet paper debacle when COVID first hit. That is a classic example of what you're mm. meaning is just in time because yes. toilet, toilet paper is something that is low value, high volume. It's uh, mm-hmm. essentially essentially something that's quite annoying to ship. So it was it was put in that same category of just supply just in time and everything will work out. Well, it doesn't, yeah. does it? It doesn't, and we all saw what no. happened worldwide on the. Uh, on the simple change of uh, distribution of something like toilet paper, how things can go to hell quite quickly. And it, 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 when it comes to people's livelihoods, when it comes to picking your children up from daycare or school, it's just not good enough. And we, we deserve better than that. It doesn't matter if we're in North Queensland or in central Brisbane. So, um, look, mate, we can only hope that somebody like yourself has the ability to uh, get in there and, um, you know, say that, hey, don't forget us up in Mulgrave, don't forget us in North Queensland. And when you think about it, when the Bruce Highway is at its, at its busiest between Edmonton and uh, Gordon Vale, it's not something to be forgotten, hey? Mm. Oh, no. I, I, I actually um, spent quite a few years when I was in the services um, at various major cities. Brisbane and Sydney were two of them. And I was even a train driver in Sydney for a time. And I had to drive from Penrith to Sydney <coughs> CBD. And I can tell you some days sitting in that traffic compared to sitting in the traffic here and there's no difference. It, it, our commute might be a shorter distance, but that static, stagnant sitting in traffic is something we shouldn't be experiencing up here in Cairns with such a, um, a broad, you know, we're such a small city compared to those capitals. We don't get anywhere near the expenditure, even in a ratio per capita, compared to those cities. And that's where the tragedy is, that the money that was meant to be spent on all these upgrades over the years seem to have been filtered out and put off to what they call more important projects. Mm. Well, and arguably, too, when you look at... Uh, when you're driving either way on the highway, especially the one in question that we've uh, been discussing is when it's Canefield either side predominantly, um, it, it begs mm. to differ why it wouldn't be just as easy to uh, either duplicate or increase the amount of... Um, lanes and it would be a lot simpler process than trying to upgrade a road that's between uh, two busy sections of the Bruce Highway in in the Brisbane area. But I guess that's the whole problem and that, that's part of the reason why lots of us think the answer is the creation of a new state because when there's so many people condensed in small electorates in the Brisbane area and 70 or so in a 250 kilometre radius, we're outvoted and we're outrepresented and to tell her, I guess, I guess that leads me to a great question that would um, be able to talk about the state of things when it comes to being a representative, which you hope to attain, um, is how do you feel about the over-representation of the small area of the Brisbane CBD and uh, in the 250-kilometre radius around it uh, compared to, say, the 17-odd seats in central and north Queensland, which you hope to be one of? What are your thoughts? How, how, 
how difficult a task is it going to be once hopefully you become a representative to deal with that disparity? Well, it's going to be a challenge in itself. Um, my nature is one that uh, I'm very stubbornly determined. So on that side, I'm going to I'm going to make them uncomfortable. I'm just definitely going to make them know um, what electorate I represent and what we need. But when you consider Cairns is one of the smaller electorates in our, it's just next to Mulgrave. We've got Cairns. It's quite a small electorate. If you compare it to some of the ones in Brisbane, in Brisbane, you could walk around it with a cup of coffee and not finish your coffee by the time you've covered that electorate. And that's the unjust thing when you've got Mulgrave, where I am, and Treasure to the west. Those are electorates that you need a, you need a couple of days to have any chance of reasonably covering your ground and getting the message across or meeting people. So it, it shows you how lazy the politicians are down there that they have these tiny little electorates and they, the other side of it too is you will have just in Brisbane CVD alone how many members they have where the issues are universal across all of them. Yet, just between Cairns and Mulgrave, the issues are quite different. Yeah, we've got people that work in Cairns or vice versa in Mulgrave and people that live in Mulgrave work in Cairns. Um, we've got a small set of businesses here. We've got farming. But our needs in Mulgrave are different to Cairns. So that's the big um, negative on our representation up here and what we really should be getting compared to what we actually are. So you're correct in that. It is going to be a one hell of a fight to to get what we deserve and need. And as we agree, there's one way to do it, but it's getting that achieved, and that's having a new state. Well, yes, and look, it's it's. I guess I guess I guess it's our point to talk about the disillusionment of the fact that we have a representative, a Labor representative, Curtis Pitt, who's just a long-standing representative, and his father was a representative before him. But I guess it's easy to see um, that that is a part of the reason of why we have been forgotten is because if if we have Brisbane's man in Mulgrave as opposed to Mulgrave's man in Brisbane, the system is lost to us. And when we already have a disparity of representation from a place like North Queensland to Brisbane CBD, if we have if we have basically a a person in the midst that's only going to go go down and take orders and bring it back and 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 distribute the the information accordingly. It's not in our best interest. It's not in the best interest of the whole community at large, nor the growth and prosperity of the greater area of North Queensland. We can only hope people like yourself have the ability to tip the apple cart when it comes to that sort of mindset for lots of these big party representatives like Curtis. Unless he's hard, as good as a job as he might think he does. It is a simple fact. When it comes to people, LNP or Labor, if they're taking orders and bringing them back, it's not in our best interests. And we can only hope, mate, that you can do well against that. Well, um, I've certainly made it clear, um, and the KAP has definitely enabled me to be this way, is I've made it clear, and I remind them regularly, that on our core values and principles, number one is clearly written there. Number one is the <coughs> important one, and that's that the member, that's me, represents the electorate of Mulgrave first and foremost for what's um, most important for the people and on my conscience. So that's the first thing, and it just follows up with as long as it meets the core values and principles below, mm. and it follows through with all those. Now, those core values and principles are pretty much universal for any Australian. So it's already clearly stated in my dossier that this is what I'm here to do, represent Mulgrave. Um, I'm not coming into my father's name. I'm here um, on my own name, standing as someone who's worked pretty darn hard his entire life, served proudly, and decided enough is enough, it's time that the people who are supposed to be heard have someone that's willing to listen to them and hear them. And that's, and that's what lots of uh, electorates in the North Queensland and Central Queensland area need. And 
Look, I find it quite fitting. I want to um, not, not, I want I want to go off not our sitting, sitting representative, but a perspective from uh, the other big party because I only got home this evening and um, che- quickly checked the letterbox before I rushed into the house, and I happened to have a. Uh, a, a, a letter distributed to, about the upcoming election and how I can post my vote, mm. and it was thanks to our uh, local representative from the Liberal National Party, which, which no doubt it's getting returned to them to be able to see if I wanted to make my post on that vote or not. And I have no idea who the candidate is. I've, I, I, I won't even bother saying his name, but I have no idea who he is. I've never seen him before. I've never met him. I've never seen him in the community. And um, I, my point is, is, this is how they treat the voter. It's it's a lowest common denominator. Oh, just and while we're at it, we might just spend all this money distributing letters to find out uh, the percentage of Mulgrave that might make a postal vote. And we're not necessarily worried about the good representative to get elected. They could have spent the money accordingly for his advertising, but they're more inclined to uh, try and get as much information about uh, postal voting instead. This is this is what we have to put up. We with need to we need to party. clarify for the audience. Yeah, we need to clarify the audience. Can you tell us now? It, it's got a postal vote form in there, and that's the official um, electoral commission of Queensland postal form, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Official post. Yep, that's the registration for. Now, where is the envelope addressed to? Well, that's ex- that, that, and this is where I was starting to lean towards because I've seen yeah. another uh, another post from a representative running uh, down in central Queensland, and it's the same premise. It's not going straight back to the mm. uh, electoral commissions office uh, down in Queensland, no doubt. It is going to probably a LNP no. headquarters where they can. Uh, uh, gather information and data about who and what are going to do uh, what voting patterns from particular areas. And, and my point is, is, as wrong as that is in my mind, as, man, as it would be in most mm. people's mind, is fancy not trying to devote uh, the, the, the power and energy into putting their man in Mulgrave, in, you know, to try and get him elected. Instead, the disdain is, oh, let's just try and gather as much information as we can anyway and what will happen will happen. It's it's a completely backwards process, and I guess this is just the way the big parties are. All the more power to uh, the minor parties like KAP and and uh, and all the others, One Nation, to, to say, look, we're, we're all about representing our people and we're taking it the other way around because it's, it's, up, it's utterly well, absurd. Well, if we take the gloves off a little bit for, for this subject... I noted very carefully about a month ago um, on one of the TV channels when they were talking to the LNP, the LNP actually said they're dedicating all their time and resources to Cairns and Barron River. And that shows you again the disdain they have for Mulgrave, which a lot of people in politics consider the low-end demographic of Cairns not worth the time. And that's what I hope to stop is because I live in White Rock and as someone who lives in Mulgrave would know what White Rock represents to Cairns. And I tell you what, I'm proud to be in White Rock and I'm proud to be around these people that I live with. They're lovely family. Some of them struggling. Some of them don't give a damn. Some of them working hard to get somewhere, but they all have something in common. They're proud to be Australian and they're proud to be where they are and this is something we need to get across to those major parties is that you just can't come here score a seat and then treat us with contempt because there's other areas that are more important and the the current member his pitiful effort on tv at the moment of spending all the last two weeks in cairns campaigning for things for cairns and barren river alongside his counterparts. But not once on the media has he presented anything of real benefit for Mulgrave. Well, and this is right. And Attila, I can tell you now, as a, as a person who's avidly committed to trying to educate and, um, you know, convince the general population of central North Queensland that the future for our regions is to become a new state, I can avidly tell you the day that mm. I saw the member for Mulgrave it was only recently, probably within 12, 12 months or 18 months ago, on a newscast being asked the question of, do you think there should be um, at least the question asked of whether we should be a new state? He said, I think anybody who supports that notion should ha- take a good hard look at themselves. As a sitting representative, to be so dismissive, <laughs> it only proved the disdain that the two mm. parties have for the local regions of, and communities of, of North Queensland that they just completely dismissive because they have that power. 
They have that power and voter base mm. from Brisbane and the CBD and surrounding area of southern and southeast Queensland, yeah. and we need to change the vote. I want to lead on to another question mm. now, Attila, and it's about that representation, yep. but but the next level is what do yourself mm. should you prove successful in? Uh, uh, being elected the member of Mulgrave in the upcoming election and should hopefully KAP do well in any form of way, uh, what do you guys plan to do should you hold any form of balance of power? Will you hold the, will you hold the big parties, whoever comes begging to help make government, will you hold them accountable and will you try and actually utilise that balance of power to really get things moving for central North Queensland? Fundamentally, will you guys can seriously consider the question for trying to force the commission into a into looking into the new state. What are your thoughts? Okay, I'll I'll answer each of those on their individual levels sure. because there's a few questions in there. Now the first one is um, when I get elected, it's to represent Mulgrave first and foremost. As I said, it's the core values. We've got a serious problem with crime. Um, specifically juvenile crime, which surprisingly is around 50-50 of all offences in the region. We really need to focus on local workers for local contracts, whether it be large developments or supply. We need it to be local. And I, my, my hope is that we can have rings like a ripple in the water where if there's a project happening in Mulgrave, the tenders are first sought in Mulgrave. Where they can't be filled from Mulgrave, we source from the surrounding electorate. Where they can't be filled there, we go to the next. So we're, as much as possible, using local people, local companies, local machinery, and local resources. And I'm not a, I'm not an environmentalist, but it makes sense on the, that level as well because you're reducing transport costs. Yes, exactly. Travelling and all that other associated. The other side to that is... We need to really start looking, and I've mentioned it before, looking to the future, planning now for the growth. I don't want to see um, another development go up, but no proper transport corridor planning in that resource. We need confidence, and how does how do we get confidence back in the region? You need good government that's planning ahead, showing businesses and entrepreneurs that if you invest here in jobs, and growing a business, it'll be worth it. So that's that side of the question. No, that's the other side answer, is when it, comes to represent, when it comes to representation, whether it be that we have the balance of power or not, I will be making sure they know who I am. I will be making sure they know what Mulgrave wants, and I will be making it very uncomfortable for them until such time as they do provide us with our needs and provide us with our wants. It's too easy to go down there and fall for the trap and, you know, become someone's buddy and that. I'm not interested in making friends down there. It's not my job to go down there and make friends. <clears throat> my job is to go down there with people's voices ringing in my ears on what they want and they demand. And I want to make sure I can resonate that very clearly to the members down there they won't be able to hide from me, I can tell you. I know there's a few bums squirming in their seats in the last couple of months since I was endorsed, and I'm glad they're squirming because they need to. There's no such thing as a safe seat, and I'm going to prove that here once and for all because we've had enough of it. When it comes to separating the state, I am a, I'll go back, um, back before I joined the forces. I was living up here before I joined. Yeah. And I wasn't too keen on the idea of splitting the state. But since coming back here with a family and seeing the state we're in, there we've, it makes no, there is no way you could justify what's happening between the North and the South. And to separate us from them isn't just separating a state, it's separating a whole mindset because we are very different in needs, wants and nature compared to down there. They're interested in their big city high-rises and massive public transport and condensed living. The people up here want the freedoms that come with living in the north. And until we get representation that understands that need for the families of the future, we're never going to get 
the full um, full fruits of our labour. No, no, and well said, mate, because um, the, the full fruits of our labour is something that's being taken for granted for the fact that there's people avidly receiving uh, revenue from the regions, especially when it comes to simple things like the coal mining revenue, and we're not seeing even a poof teeth of that return in, in things like the upgrading of roads and even the simple infrastructure to um, help our communities grow, to help them flourish, because if a community can be invested in for something like the Cross River Rail, it's such a significant investment where such a significant portion of the state will never actively use or undertake or, or seek to use there's a huge disparity. And when you consider that there's no investment of that nature going on into um, the central and north Queensland regions, it's the mind boggles. And if we could only take, if we could only take the future into our own hands and make the decisions that would affect us most, uh, just think of the things that we could do. And we could think, we could think far ahead of the future instead of just into the next election cycle. Mm. So it's, it's exciting. Actually, I'll refer to what, can I, can I inter- interrupt? No, of course, go, mate, go, mate. Um, you mentioned that, you mentioned about a year ago how the current member mentioned about there's, you know, that thinking <coughs> about a separate state is madness and his justification of terms. He actually did bring it up recently as well, if you weren't aware, um, during the COVID crisis and the border lockdowns and when we had Yarrabah locked up from us, there were a few people up here asking for a border to separate us from down south who had a um, certain number of the cases there. And there was discussion about and promoting of a quarantine border somewhere in central Queensland to separate us so we could continue to at least have an economy. And the current member and a few others in his party said, no, we can't do that because that might encourage him to actually keep a border. So <laughs> even even in a sense of something that could have helped us here in North Queensland, they refused to just because it might hint that a border makes sense. That's how far <laughs> they are against it. And, and and that's the example of the Brisbane's man in Mulgrave as opposed to Mulgrave's man in Brisbane mm-hmm. because it's not, it's not about what's good for us. It's about trying to maintain that the one shoe size fits all in the whole great state of Queensland. And with $100 billion on the chalkboard, and uh, not sig- significant, uh, with a significant lack of investment in the central and north Queensland regions for the portion of that debt, the mind boggles as to why any representative worth their weight in gold wouldn't even consider asking the question of whether it's viable or wouldn't even entertain the idea of whether or not we could stand there on, on our own two feet. The fact that it could be dismissed so easily from a big party representative, in my mind, mm. is, 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 is a sh- only a detriment to the character of that person and the want and the need of better men of their community. So, uh, Tiller, in the, in, the, in the front of trying to uh, topple over uh, the current represent, representative of Mulgrave, we wish you luck because anything would be better than the current state of affairs, but you would be far, a far superior candidate in many different ways. I guess we should go on to um, another topic because uh, KAP have many different policies. And, look, I, I, in the last week I've, I've been starting to keep an eye on many of the candidates that you guys are starting to field uh, uh, and... Look, we could talk about Mulgrave to the cows come home as well, but what, what, what's the team's thoughts on the greater prosperity for the North Queensland area? Because it seems that you guys have, have managed to find some fantastic candidates, including yourself, to try and represent uh, many electorates in the whole North Queensland area. Did you Have you guys spoken much about what you guys want to achieve going forward um, post the 2020 election? We, we were, um, actually had an opportunity to gather together um, shortly after our endorsement, we met up in Townsville to um, get to know each other a little bit, get some PR work done, some photo work done. And there were two things I noted. The first and most important one was there wasn't a single career politician amongst them. They weren't, weren't born, trained and bred to be uh, yes men to a party. They're all hardworking men and women who have either provided services within the community or worked in the mining industry, on the farms. They're, so we all have that connection and we bonded so well because we were a group of people that got together for a common fight and a common cause. When it comes to core values and policies and what we hope to achieve in each electorate, um, we had all different sorts of plans and goals 
But when you look at each of those, whether it be Kieran in the Whit Sunday and um, him wanting to get that radio rodeo stand set up and get it up and running and really high level international, um, or Tanika up in Cook about the services there. We all had very similar goals, and that's infrastructure, real strong, stable, strong infrastructure and development, protection of our primary and secondary industries. That's another common one. And almost every single electorate has the same issue when it comes to crime. That's especially for between Townsville, Cairns and Mount Isa. It's like the triangle of death when it comes to these kids. So there the the biggest one is that primary and secondary industry and we're losing that term. Everyone's referring to manufacturing or their farming. It's it, in the end it's a, it's a classic term of primary and secondary industry and there's a reason why it's called primary and secondary. Because with without it there is no tertiary. So they're the common grounds that we have, but as I said we all have our specific needs for each electorate that are tied in through those areas. Yeah, so can not I just jump in there. Of course you can. Well, I think I think we're going to uh, start talking about crime. But Bill, uh, do you want to? Yeah, a that, that's is it. No, that's where I was going. Um, Julian Wood was uh, is is for Farangara down in uh, Townsville. Um, mm. I think she was uh, Take Back Townsville, I think was her yes. group. Correct. Um, you've got a history there with the Safe Nights, so mm -hmm. you've got something in common in there. Um, yep. There's another, uh, there's a, some other groups, so I just, I think there's a Jeff Adams and it's uh, something like One Standard for All Citizens or something like that there. Mm -hmm. um, and then they've got um, CJAG as well he here, um, yes. uh, Crime. Crime Justice Action Group, and I think there was also the Cairns Regulators. Now, um, there seems to be a multitude uh, of these groups around, or you know, has been. It's really be good if someone could pull all those together and and sort of get them organised where they're acting more as one. Um, mm. We did we did have a situation back in April, I think, uh, Mitch Meyer, that it was going to be a big protest at the uh, court at, for the at the courthouse or something like that. I recall that, yep. And, that case. and and I think I think the I think it got up to at least about 800 people had registered to attend when COVID mm. sort of hit and and smashed that idea. And I think <laughs> I think COVID. Has actually been a bit of a saving grace for the incumbent government in regards to it has stopped a lot of these groups from um, getting their um, campaigns off the ground. Not not just in crime, but uh, I think also you've got the green shirts and the farmers and things like that. It's hard to get back on the road to um, uh, campaign against the incumbent government with with uh, uh, policies and that. And I think I can answer your question on that. I already know where you're going with it, the question that you're going to ask. And firstly, we've got so many different groups because each group is um, targeting the issue of crime and youth crime in a unique way, where my group is about patrolling the suburbs that we live in and being a little bit of a stopgap between Neighbourhood Watch and the police, a bit of a fill-in there. You've got the Crime Justice Action Group, which are about lobbying and um, publicity. And then you've got the regulators who are about capturing the information that's on social media and making it public. So we've got all these groups, but what we've lacked, and it's one thing I hope to achieve once elected, is to be willing to say to these guys, OK, let's meet up and organise an official government meeting with your representative and bring all your cards, lay them on the table and show us what your wants and needs are for each group and what we can come up with to resolve this and how it would tie in with one of CADA's um, policies, which is 
the relocation sentencing. So, and that's something that all these groups have lacked, is a politician who's willing to sit down with them and listen to them and not just as I've experienced in my time in Can Safe Nights where you get called in there to be told that you don't how you don't know how it works in government to which I respond that they obviously don't know how it works here for the people on the ground and they don't really listen to you. They just give you the appeasement of having a chance to be seen with them but the conversation dies the moment the books are closed and people walk out the door. It isn't carried on their shoulder as a representative of the electorate and taken with them to Parliament because, as has been mentioned so many times, once they get down there, there are a set rules and regulations that they must abide by if they're to be ex- have any hope of... Um, and as we we know, most politicians, when they get into those big parties... Their only aspiration is the big bucks. How can they fill their back pocket the quickest? And to present to Brisbane the serious issue of crime we have would be, um, it would be detrimental to their career within the party. So they shut their mouth and toe the line. I think the other thing is too, I don't, don't think Brisbane actually has the stomach to Enact the, act the things that needed because um, they're dealing with uh, about three, you know, two and a half million voters down there mm. that they've got to take in considering their sensitivities of all these sort of issues, you know, um, human rights and all that, you know, the old old um, do-gooder sort of syndrome, which is is okay for them because it's they they're not faced with it in, on a daily basis. So I don't think it's going to ever be possible for um, Brisbane, a parliament in Brisbane, to write rules, regulations and laws that, while satisfying the the sensitivities of the people in South East Queensland, address the real problems here. I think that, that's that's one of the real problems. They just mm. can't do it because it, it would hurt them too much in in those... Uh, sensitive ele- inner city electorates and urban areas. We forget very, and this is something the politicians have convinced us. Um, they've convinced us that they can please everybody. Well, the fact is you can't please everybody all the time. And to be a politician, to be a representative, you have to have the, the stamina and the s- stubborn strength to say this must be done, let's do it. Now, I'm not saying ignore the noisy minority. You can't ignore the noisy minority because you're being um, as bad as the politicians who ignore us up here. But what you can do is help people realise there are times where to get balance, you need to step on toes sometimes, whether it be the the do-gooders with these kids and trying to let them get away with everything while stomping on someone who does the right thing and defends their property. These are all issues where we need to make it clear that we're not ignoring the do-gooders. We're just, we've got to make it clear to them there are certain times where you have to provide discipline and you have to deprive people of certain liberties because of their actions. It's not just for the sake of depriving their liberty. Depriving your liberty and discipline is a road towards a better citizen instead of a revolving door criminal. Well, and that, yeah, uh, just nice as, as, as both of you being ex-servicemen, I'm sure you can attest to the fact that a little mm-hmm. bit of discipline only does the soul well, yeah? Well, the, the, the thing with the military is it is slightly different because the military, of course. they break you to make you, which we can't do in society. No, of course You could never do that in society. But there is a, there is a similarity there where um, you, you do the wrong thing, you wear the punishment. And they were very creative with their punishments. Mm. But we already have seen, if you've been up here from the early 80s, 90s, 
you would have seen there is a system that does work. It's been proven. That system has been updated and upgraded to a newer, um, broader and more targeted system of breaking the cycle of crime, taking these youth away from their environment, which, can't, to be honest, a lot of these, these juveniles are in a horrible environment, taking them out of that, taking them out of the bad influences and instilling in them the confidence and self-discipline to become a productive so, uh, member of society and then return to our society and not fall yes. back into it. And contribute, so, and contribute Bates, in, in, in many ways more than they could ever yeah. could dream, yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of these kids, people go on about, oh, you know, it's, it's horrible. Take A lot of these kids I still know today who are now grown-ups with their own kids going up there to meet old men, to to get some of what they had when they were growing up to instill in them the importance of being a good member of society, productive and family orientated. That's a big part. Definitely. Good yes. families make good children, make a good future. Look, just to, yeah. just to finish on that, especially when it comes to the KAP policy, when it comes to relocation mm. sentencing, before I go to you, Bill, where you can make your comment, uh, I just wanted to read it out from the KAP website, actually, and it's, it's just entitled A Serious Plan to Break the Crime Cycle. Crime is a huge problem in regional Queensland. Uh, the traditional sentencing and incarceration laws are not working, particularly for young offenders. I think we covered that quite well. I'll continue. So magistrates currently only have two options when dealing with an offender. Send them to jail or put them straight back into the community. KAP's relocation sentencing policy would give them another option. Magistrates could uh, be able to send offenders to a remote approved property. They would work on the land to learn the life skills and become better society members. This would give offenders, particularly young offenders, a chance to break the offending cycle before they become professional criminals while still keeping the community safe. I think that encapsulated quite well there on the KAP website, and we've definitely covered that. You've made that point very clear, and um, look, it's straightforward enough. And as you say, it's something that's been tried and tested in many different ways in the past, but um, obviously the KAP think that it's something that we should revisit. Um, Bill, what was your point that you wanted to make out? Well, I, I just want to point out with the two major parties and their attitudes towards um, crime um, and trying to uh, make it dissipate a bit, I, I think their attitude is more they're quite content to let, let us be perpetual victims rather than sort of really address the problems. Um, and the other thing we just also, I just noticed too, the... Government's also just introduced laws to allow prisoners with less than three year sentences to vote in the election for the first time. Now, my understanding for uh, a lot of lot of people go to jail for quite serious offences and you know hardly get three years. So, a lot of these prisoners will be fairly serious criminals in regards to now that they they can cast their vote in the election. Um, does that concern you a little bit, Attila? It's it's not really a concern. I you can you could a lot of people would say that well that's a that's a policy that benefits the Labor Party. Well, it doesn't really benefit the Labor Party because the Labor Party are the ones that have um, you know have put them in there in the first place. You could you could point to, but it's it's. It's one thing to do that, and my view on it is you have you have a disdain for society and committed, in some cases, serious offences, and you have been taken out of society because you are unsafe to society, you're a danger, or whatever else the reason is for you being there. Therefore, your right to influence the future should be taken too because you have to learn to be part of society and be reintroduced into society before you can have um, a say and influence on what's happening. So it's, it's, a, it's a negative for a lot of parties. The Labor may think it's good for them, but I can't see that. I think it being detrimental because um, a big part of the Labor Party is and all the other majors. Well, I guess I, 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 I used to. 
You could also argue that it works in their benefit because if if the Labor Party is traditionally in the last little while soft on crime, I suppose you'd want to vote for them if you only got three years instead of Mm. seven. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's what a a lot of people point to and suspect that's what was brought in. I I, I don't necessarily agree with that, that, but I was um, more saying it in jest, but mm. it's still, it's a a point that could be made. It is. (laughs) It could be, yes. Yeah. Bill, what was your thought? uh, Yeah. How many, how many of those are actually going to vote a proper vote and not do a donkey vote? Of course, of course, yes. Uh, I look at more, more as, as, yeah, another, another thing basically just giving the victims another kick in the guts, like, yeah, you know, exactly. You, you, you're, you're a victim of crime, uh, the perpetrators don't get a reasonable sentence, you don't get any restitution from them, um, and it just goes, and you can expect, an, expect another visit some, sometime later and be a victim again. It's, <laughs> it's just like the victims don't matter, and, mm. but, the criminals do, if you know what I mean. It's, it's yeah. something, something's yeah. got to give somewhere along the line. That's I, all. I, I'm, well, cu- I'm curious as to where their, reg- where their registered uh, electorate is. Do they, are they, do they vote in the seat of Glo- Lotus Glen or do they vote in the seat of where they'd otherwise mm. be living? Actually, yeah, never <laughs> thought of that one either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what you it's supposed say, sorry, to be where yeah. you reside. Yeah. It's supposed to be where you reside and you're registered to vote. Exactly right. So their residence. It's the yeah. boggles how so they. So that is a good yeah. point. Mm. But the other side of it too with crime, um, perpetuating crime is a business in itself. <coughs> it's a business that gives the government the ability to enforce on us more laws. Those laws that aren't actually used to target the criminals, but used against the average citizen, who may occasionally have a little slip-up. So we're, we're being um, swamped by law after law after law, but there is no positive effect on the cycle of crime, whether it be drugs, um, whether it be corporate, whether it be uh, um, low-level basic crime or opportunistic crime. It hasn't really changed it. These laws have all they've done is stifled people from going about their daily lives or encroached on their privacy. That's all that's been achieved. And for a big government that wants control and wants to have more power to provide the will of the southeast corner, what better way? Yes, and um, look, I guess they keep us busy with the fact that crime is running so rampant in the regions. And, mm. and while while we're yeah. busy trying to yell and scream at the fact that our kids are running right and uh, stealing cars left, right, and centre, and do you know mm. it was only it was only the start of the week this week. Uh, one of my work colleagues came to work. His partner is four mm. weeks out from giving birth to their first child, and he was just talking about an incident on the road as he turned into the driveway of where we work, and um, he got a call 15 mm. minutes later that his partner had gone out and the car was gone. And uh, being four weeks pregnant, he, uh, she said, oh, I better check around the corner in case I'd, I'd, I've parked it there and forgotten. But I uh, obviously checked. And like, to her credit, she's like, she was in utter disbelief apparently. And lo and behold, the mm. car was missing and they'd gone into the house in the evening and taken the keys off where, where they store them near the kitchen. And this was while they were asleep. And this is, this is the usual story that we're starting to hear on too frequent a basis. And it has to stop. Yeah. And look, policy after policy can be said about how we might be able to solve our young children from going down the path of crime. Lord knows every teenager, uh, no doubt, has that series of boredom where they have the ability to turn left or right. But we need to be able to make them turn to the right. And uh, look, when it comes mm. to crime, in, as opposed to a responsive way of dealing with this, is how do we create opportunities for them? How do we keep them from being mm. bored teenagers knowing, well, I don't know what I'm going to do after school because there's there's no NQEA uh, tra- tra- trades uh, apprenticeships going like there used to be 30 years mm. ago. There's not necessarily that manufacturing sector in the north of, uh, northern area of, mm. of Queensland like there used to be. How do we solve the problem of our youth being into this situation instead of just trying to create great policies to respond to it. Because all I know is if there was 25 representatives that was just from the central and north Queensland regions that dealt with the policy making to deal with the youth of our regions to not go down these paths, I think we would have far greater success than the representatives that represent the far-off here, south-east corner to deal with it. So 
Uh, look, relocation sentencing is one facet of that, and look, it'd be mm. interesting to see how successful KAP is with that, you guys yourself. But otherwise, mate, as somebody that's an ex-serviceman, um, the implementation of discipline as well as through your, your safe nights work, um, it's just a problem that's got to stop, if, if, if not just for the, mm. the community at large, for, for the future of uh, our young people, hey? Yeah. Well, this, this, this saying that they're doing it because they're bored, that is the do-gooders war cry. Oh, yes. If you're out there and you meet these kids, and I've met, and I can tell you, 80, 85% of the kids I met out on the streets at night, they are there because they are escaping a home that's either drugs, alcohol, or abuse, and they don't want to be home. So they're out in the street just wandering harmlessly, <clears throat> but then they run into this group of kids who are up to no good. They feel accepted, they feel welcome, they feel loved, and they, ta- they take on to that and they latch on to it and they end up falling into that group. Boredom, seriously. There was no, there was nothing that the kids have now that we had when we grew up. Well, exactly. But we knew how to, we knew how to entertain ourselves. And okay, sometimes, I know, speaking from my own experience, I was a cheeky little bugger sometimes and I had to get a boot from the corner shop man or the Mr. Policeman. But yeah, you, you had, you had that, um, fear and respect for your elders. And that side has not been taught. You hear people screaming about how the parents need to be held accountable. Well, how can a parent be held accountable when they cannot even tell their 12-year-old to go to your room? Because it's against the law, it's a deprivation of liberty, and if that kid rings up the coppers, they have to answer the call. Okay, most of the time you get the coppers that, and a lot of the police are good, and they really try and support the parents in this dilemma. But the fact is, these kids know the law and know or think they know their rights well enough to get away with this stuff. So the discipline side of it is um, it needs to be provided in the home first, and we need to be able to give parents the ability and the right to discipline. And when we talk about discipline, the Certain groups always yell abuse, abuse, abuse when you talk about discipline. But the discipline is a broad spectrum. And discipline is not abuse because a discipline is done through love and care. Where abuse is just from anger. So well, of course. There is a and, there, and, and there could be significant so, change for the better at the end of uh, disciplinary mm, uh, actions as opposed to abusive, uh, yeah. uh, abusive ones. Well, I'll tell you something now that not many people know, but I was one of those kids on the wrong path when I was growing up. Mm. And I was very quickly steered onto the right path because I had people around me that gave a damn. Not just my parents, but other people around me, friends and relatives who actually gave a damn and wanted to make sure that I didn't fall into that trap. Mm. And if it wasn't for those around me that cared, who knows where I would have ended up. So I speak from not only someone who wants to lead the electorate and our nation into a direction of rectifying this problem, but from experience, from being on the other side, being the little scallywag that needed a good proverbial boot up the ass. Well, mate, and, and all the more reason people with that sort of experience of, uh, I guess, the the, the the mild sense of misspent youth, especially from people who have born and bred and raised in the regions, to be able to deal with the problems that they see their own uh, now young people facing, because it's certainly not going to be solved mm. by bureaucrats from the southeast corner. It's not going to be solved by anybody mm. sitting in the Tower of Power in Brisbane, and it's mm. only up to us to be able to respond and actively deal with it in the best way we see possible in the way that we live here, which is not the same way that people live down in the southeast corner. Bill, I sense that you wanted to um, make a comment uh, before. And gentlemen, I must, uh, I must say that we're coming up to an hour, so I, I might wrap things up sometime well, soon just so we don't yeah. impart too much into the evening of Attila. So go, Bill. Yeah, I just want to change the subject a little bit in okay. regards to um, the tinging, green tinging of the LNP and mm. lookalike Labor. And I think just recently the LNP have basically come out 
and sort of downplayed the need for coal-fired power stations and and sort of pushing away from that. Now, that's pretty surprising. Um, they're sort of giving coal... It looks like they're going to give coal a bit of bash. I mean, they're quite happy to take four, four or five billion dollars of royalties down the southeast corner to keep paying off their bloody uh, 100, 100 billion, billion dollars of credit debt. Um, but... They seem to come out and give the old coal industry a bit of a thump in every one while. Uh, I find it quite hypocritical that on one hand they're ha- only too happy to channel all the money down to the southeast corner for uh, paying for infrastructure down there, and at the same time trying to belittle the people in central North Queensland who make a living uh, in the coal industry and, and the coal-fired power stations. Now, I notice that's a bit of a difference with the KAP in regards to trying to get um, energies onto a living, level playing field in regards to um, the renewables, the so-called the cheapest form of electricity there is, <laughs> uh, versus uh, uh, coal-fired power. Um, how do you see it going forward? We, we have to just look historically... First of all, you've got um, you've you've got this new energy coming up, this upcoming energy of solar and wind, and it's being developed and progressed. Um, we've had a huge leap forward in solar panels, for example. Now they're currently around the 20% efficient. Now that's the amount of energy it receives to how much it converts to electricity. It was sitting around 12%, and it was actually a Queensland professor that. Um, uh, made the, the leap forward in this generation ability to get us up to around 20%, and we've just passed that mark again. Now, this energy source is progressing and improving dramatically. We should be allowing this technology to permeate through our industries, our homes, our businesses, and our government at a natural rate, because... There are a lot of benefits to naturally letting it progress. It's a bit like back in the day, a computer that was worth $3,000 just a few years ago is only worth a few hundred now because technology is developed. We should be looking at it the same way with this solar and wind. As it progresses, the earlier technology becomes more affordable, more available, and we can progressively upgrade. Forcing through grants a sudden dumping of this source, sort of um, electricity generation is actually pushing the price artificially up and not really benefic- benefiting everyone because all it's done now is lifted our power costs to such a ridiculously high level compared to where it really should be going back 15 years ago when this, I think, this push I think started. What, what, I think one of the things there is wh- once you start subsidising uh, mm-hmm. anything and making making the industry comfortable. Like you could, you, you could equate it to um, the Australian car industry when you started mm-hmm. subsidising and protecting that. I mean, if it, was, if it wasn't for a breakdown of competition and, and Japanese cars come, we'll probably be driving around in, in um, FB Holdens with drum brakes and something because mm-hmm. there's no incentive to improve your product. So... Yeah. That, that's where su- subsidising and uh, mm-hmm. giving guaranteed tariffs uh, allows, allows the industry not to sort of put its best foot forward for improving and developing. But in regards well, that, to... That's our argument is that, and one of the things we've been saying in KAP is if it's, if it's, so, um, if it's so affordable and so profitable and s- so good... <laughs> if they're talking about coal... Oh. <laughs> Dave, what right, are you doing? Hey. And then I decided to get in. I did mean to start the music. Sorry, continue your thought, Attila. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, they're talking about how bad coal is. Well, if you're saying coal is bad, there's only one option, other option right now to keep our industry moving and our nation growing, and that's nuclear. So if you can't accept nuclear... Forget about arguing against coal. <laughs> we're we're getting entertainment. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, 
yeah, we need the we need we need the base load power. We need something there that's stable and strong. And until such time that we have another viable option that is consistently performing well, day and night, peak and non-peak, we have to continue to provide the coal. And to to have coal-fired power stations here is a great boost for Queensland economy because we can export our power to those states that have shut theirs down <laughs> and now have the most unstable power in the planet. Yeah. Well, we, well, we exactly. do we do make a we do actually make a few bob out of selling um, our generator uh, capacity mm-hmm. because uh, Queensland typically can produce about uh, a gigawatt or more, more power than it actually needs at any time mm. and quite often is, is selling down to the uh, south. Yeah. And, um, but, but, I mean, it all depends what if the sun's shining or the wind's blowing, but uh, uh, the coal's always there to sort of help out when needed. Yes. Um, so that, that's our thing. I think the other big, big point about solar and, um, and wind is I don't think that there's enough attention given to... Oh, I don't think anyone's yet got a, a disposal... Um, uh, policy in regards to how they're going to uh, get rid of these things after their time of life because Mm. typically both wind and solar only have a 20-year life at all. Tight, which is a third of that of a coal-fired well, power Actually, station. wind wind has a 100-year, but it needs a 25-year cycle of um, upgrades. So every 25 years, it needs a major upgrade. Um, but, yeah, it's a 100-year life cycle on a wind turbine, but mm. those upgrades are major. You're talking... Oh, uh, yeah, you know, the, you might as well the build another cost one, of yeah. actually building it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's pretty hard to do when, when a lot of... Mm. Like in Europe, a lot of them are out at sea. Mm. They reckon... The actual um, servicing and that, the ones, the sea, uh, offshore ones, her, mm. are horrific. But yeah. we already got a, got a lot of decommissioned um, uh, wind farms in mm-hmm. North America and in Europe, and they are posing a bit of a, bit of a challenge in regards to disposal. But uh, yeah. I think solar panels are even a big bigger problem because of, of uh, a lot of the um, rare earths that are in them, mm. and and what we do with those panels after. After they're finished with, and there's a lot of yes, them, billions of them. It's a spot on. It's a spot on point you presented, Bill, because we're up to what is it, year 16 of the major yep. push for 16 years ago was the start of the big push. So we're looking in another another nine years or less, because solar panels weren't as efficient back then. So about nine years or less, where we're going to start seeing these panels coming off roofs, left, right, and centre. Exactly. And where are they going to go? How are we going to recycle them? Because recycling needs a lot of energy. And hmm. we can't recycle if we can't afford to. Because there's got to be – a business isn't going to recycle if it's running at a loss. Well, you can, boost, you can, boost, we'll up the, you can boost up the uh, you can boost up the nearest coal-fired power station to get the energy requirements to recycle a, uh, a solar panel. Wouldn't yeah. that be the you great You need coal-fired power stations to recycle. <laughs> so if you want to be green, you've got to have our coal. <laughs> the greenest thing you can do be... is to not have a solar panel. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that yeah. an absurd thing? Yeah. Look, I, I guess the component is, and I, I, I'm going to go back to the point of subsidies for these, and I must apologise about mm-hmm. my cutout. Jen, the, my, my headphones just went dark. So, um, I, I love the example that Alan Jones uses frequently and has done since he was just recently retired on his uh, radio show was you, you got two bakers and they're in the same suburb, 20 minutes away from each other, and they're both baking bread. If you're going to give one baker the ability through subsidy to make his bread cheaper, then it's not a fair market. It's, 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 it's the simplest way to be able to say, you can't tell me that the cost of the power generated from something like a solar, a solar panel or a wind turbine, when it's uh, subsidised by the taxpayer, you can't tell me that that power is as clean and just as the power that's come out of a coal past, uh, coal-fired power station without any subsidy. And the, 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 the ramifications of the simple fact of that matter is, is uh, if it could stand on its own two feet, why doesn't it do it? And I think you covered that yeah. quite nicely in your comment just before, it. But there are also emissions. We're not talking about... There's suddenly this worldwide mass demand for wind and solar, and it's an art, artificial demand. It's not a natural demand. So yes. We have to get this stuff produced en masse in a short period of time, causing 
actually a dramatic increase in our emissions, where if we steadily and slowly increased our our solar and wind power generation at a steady, even, consistent rate, and improve it we as wouldn't it have this. Yeah, mm. we wouldn't have this sudden demand to pump out greenhouse <coughs> gases to hopefully fix a problem. It's, yeah. it's, you're, you're basically tipping the scales too far one way when you want them to tip the other way. And, that, and those horrible greenhouse gases, CO2, is actually plant food that's greening the planet. Very mm. surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I guess well, that's a whole separate comes, issue. Yeah. There's, a, there's a few different ways to attack it. And the simple fact is if we want to, if, if, if the Queensland government in any, in any, Tenure of election period wants to commit economic suicide by phasing out coal-fired power stations when we've got the highest grade quality coal that the rest of the world wants. Mm. Um, at the very least, they can't afford to stop shipping it to the other countries that need it because we can't yeah. afford to not have that income coming in. So mm. why we wouldn't burn it ourselves and have the highest quality coal, uh, cleanest quality coal burning in our own power generators is that's absolutely mm. absurd. Yeah. Now I'm yeah. I'm I'm one of those strange ones. I confuse people because I'm I'm for coal-fired power stations that we still need them. That no matter how you look at it, what no, side course. you're yeah. on, logically coal-fired. But on the same instance, our home has been off-grid, electro, no electricity from the grid for two and a half years. So we're completely off-grid solar and battery. But you know. I'm this person that's off grid, not hooked up, not drawing the power, but I see the need for this this affordable energy source to help our industries grow, especially at this time where our businesses and our industry, primary and secondary, are being crushed with restrictions. That's exactly right. Yes, and the power demands on a on a on a shed that might have a high capacity for manufacturing obviously mm. can have all the solar it wants, but it won't be able to keep up with the demand of what it's required. The individual yeah. households, sure, Attilo, I think we're all on the same boat when it comes to Central and North Queensland, and both the abundance of water and the abundance of the sun. I think we can mm. all agree that everyone could do their part when it comes to, especially mm. when it's the home, when it's just keeping the TVs and the lights on and the and the kettle boiling. Um, I, I think we all uh, mm. can definitely say, look. That makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to the main, mm. major infrastructure possibilities for the future of central North Queensland, I think we all understand the premise of that base load power being mm. a necessity. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's refreshing to hear people that don't shy away from the fact that they can declare that it's, it's important and the industry is important. And mm. um, look, the future may hold what it brings, but for the time and the here and the now, the logical sense is, you know, yeah. why, why, why disrupt so immediately and, and, and cause such mm. economic harm and, and job losses when it comes to the fact that it's still necessary. There's developing now, economies that need this. And, there's and, a hypocrisy yeah, of it all too. Yeah. The loudest screamers of green policy and environmental live in the most polluted or polluting area, and that's the southeast corner. It is the, ironic, the, isn't it? The greatest yeah. demand and the, the 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 biggest harm to our environment comes from that southeast yeah. corner. But they're the ones dictating to our farmers and us that live up here in this. Mm. This relatively clean, fresh region that we should be changing our ways well, to suit their posture. Well, exactly. We could and look if we had another hour of the show, Attila. But we, I guess we we should really get you back to your family and uh, and to bed so you can continue on with your work life and as well as campaign avidly for the next few weeks. So. Um, I guess we could talk to the cows come home about uh, mm. South East Queensland uh, electorates and and not just not just things like the green vote dictating to how farmers should farm their land who already have the best practices in the world. Mm. It, it, it would open up a whole other can of worms. But Attila, um, did you have mm. any finishing thoughts and um, anything you'd like to say if uh, yep. the, uh, someone listening is like myself who's a member of Mulgrave and um, the change that you're looking to bring to North Queensland and the seat of Mulgrave? Well, well, we've got a few simple phrases we use, and one of the most common ones is, I'm working for you. And it's as simple as that. I'm working for Mulgrave. And what benefits Mulgrave will benefit the state. And the other thing is, I'm not just a nice guy. I'm the right guy for the job. That's as simple as that. I'm here to fight for you guys. I'm here to fight beside you because I'm here feet on the ground, experienced what you've experienced, whether it be 
struggling to make a make a week go by and get get your bills paid and survive to a business owner to a serviceman to a volunteer in the SES it, it's an all encompassing project <clears throat> this it's yeah it's a it's a life cause it's a it's a there's no greater electorate to represent and fight for the Mulgrave because it is such a unique electorate Yes, look, and, and and we can only hope that yourself for the seat of Mulgrave, as well as, uh, you know, the KAP as a party in general for North Queensland, mm-hmm. off the topic of a new state and what you guys could do with a hung parliament, we can only hope that you guys, like yourself, bring the commitment and enthusiasm for the community at large of Mulgrave, that you could bring that and rejuvenate what could be great representation for the uh, for the electorate, mate. So I'd like to say, say good luck, and um, I'm sure Thank lots you. of our viewers would like to say good luck in trying to bring that commitment to the to the community at large. So... Um, we wish you well on that on that endeavour. Thank you so much. That's no, so Well, I guess we will wrap things up. Bill, did you have any finishing thoughts you'd like to say or a, a final no, I, sort of question? No, I wish um, until all the best in the upcoming election. Uh, I think um, the people of Mulgrave need a change down there. They've sort of um, been getting the very little out of their current um, situation, and I suppose having this. We, I mean, Curtis was the treasurer, and I don't think we got too much out of him up here in the north. And now he's the speaker; mm. you get nothing. <laughs> the Labor Party is obviously yeah. very comfortable with the seat of Mulgrave, and it should not be the case. It, it should mm-hmm. be the case that uh, the treasurer of the state would you, you would, would think would be able to mm. deliver significantly more. And it just proves yep. of the fact that we're lacking in infrastructure. That's not the case. Well, they're voting on his. They're voting on a legacy, and the last legacy. I'll, I'll say with hand in the air, he was good. And we were hoping for the same. The electorate of Mulgrave was hoping for the same, but it was shown lacking right from the word go. Yeah. Well, and uh, no we hope, sake. We hope that changes. Yes. Yes. Well, um, I guess that'll, that'll bring this evening's show to a wrap, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Attila, for your time this evening, as well as taking time out of your busy week, which is mm. no doubt hectic coming up to the state election very soon. So thank you again. Thank you. Have a good night. And I must, I, I, I must impart a special request if I could because I was about to do a spiel for our, uh, our sister podcast hosted by Matt Maloney who's, who's uh, acquainted with Robbie Catter. If, if you're speaking to with Robbie any time soon, if you could pass on Matt's regards and say if you want to come on to the Northern Vibe show, he'd uh, request yep. that you could do that for him. I'll do that. <laughs> No problem. Thanks very much. I'm sure that's a big thank you from Maloney, Attila. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. look, at, if anybody would like to learn more from uh, about Attila and uh, the guys from KAP who are, have a, a large suite of people running for Central North Queensland electorate, you can visit the kap.org.au website where you can learn more about their policy yeah. and representatives like uh, Attila. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Boot Brisbane and the campaign to create a new state for Central North Queensland, you can visit bootbrisbane.com where you can learn more about uh, how, how there is historical components and uh, uh, the, the facets in which a new state could be created to increase the representation of Central North Queensland as well as better our federal representation. Likewise, you can follow us on Facebook at bootbrisbane.com and thank you and follow uh, Yes to a North Queensland State, uh, another Facebook page on the same premise of campaigning for better representation for North Queensland. So with that, um, on Monday nights, you can listen to Matt Maloney, hopefully sometime soon, interviewing <laughs> Robbie Catter. And um, you can have an amazing listen to a fantastic host like we have this evening with Attila. So thank you and good evening, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. See you later.